Good afternoon. I'm James Wintel from the Music Division at the Library of Congress, and I'm here with jazz pianist Aaron Deal uh, to talk about his impressions of the library, his uh, recent concert here in the Coolidge Auditorium, and look at a few uh, items from our collections. Aaron, how are you doing today? How are you doing, James? It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So you uh, had a concert on Saturday night. I did. Yeah. And um, you played um, a lot of early jazz repertoire. And um, how did you, uh, in your music education, come to know about that repertoire, since it's not something that is uh, commonly played, I would say? Okay, so um, I fortunately had a grandfather who's a musician. He played trombone and piano. And so jazz was always around when I was a kid. Uh, I didn't really become introduced to um, early jazz piano, stride piano, and ragtime until probably my teens when I started to become more serious about playing jazz piano. And uh, a guy in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm from, named Johnny Ulrich, he, um, uh, my band director, Todd Stoll, he took me to, to Mr. Ulrich's house. And we spent a good maybe three hours there, and he was talking about people like Art Tatum, uh, people like uh, James P. Johnson, Fats Waller, um, and a few other pianists. And uh, before I left, he had, I think, three or four cassette tapes. And this is when people were still using cassettes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, also gave me some sheet music, which were transcriptions. Two of those transcriptions were Snowy Morning Blues by James P. Johnson, and um, another James P. Johnson piece that became sort of like the, um, the standard uh, part of the stride piano repertoire, Carolina Shout. And that was my, uh, that was the start of my interest in, in stride piano mm -hmm. and uh, attempting to, even now attempting to play it, yeah. you know. <laughs> so as you, were, as you were learning about that repertoire, um, did you have any particular uh, exercises that you did as a pianist, especially to develop your left hand? Because I know that's a, that's a big deal. You know, uh, exercises, well, first of all, I, I learned how to practice slowly mm -hmm. and understand that um, it wasn't as much about the accuracy of, of, of playing, although that's important, or making sure you, you, you make the leaps between the, the bass note and the chords, and back and forth, bass chord, bass chord, but really getting the, feel, the feeling between the syncopation of the right hand and the consistent left hand. Um, and that, that's something that just took a long time to really figure out and, and then hours and hours of listening to people like James P or Fats or Willie the Lion Smith play this repertoire, mm -hmm. understand, really understand the rhythmic, uh, the, the, the rhythmic language of stride piano, uh, which was very different from you know, I see you have some Scott Joplin, where I guess we're going to talk about that in a bit. Very different from the language of ragtime. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's, what's so challenging about playing jazz music is there's so many subtleties throughout the eras in how the swing beat, the triplet beat is interpreted. And um, so, you know, playing a piece of, uh, let's say, Jelly Roll Morton, which was, he was in a class by himself. Uh, playing a piece by him like the Pearls as opposed to playing um, some, something by Donald Lambert or something that, in the style of Donald, Donald Lambert or in the style of Teddy Wilson or something like that. It's just very diff, they're connected in, in many ways but also just very different in, in the way they approach uh, the language of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like any time you get to know a particular style of music, the further you get into it, the further you can see those differences and the subtleties of style that, um, that permeate through that music. So thinking about, uh, thinking about Jelly Roll, you said he was in a class by himself. What do you think about his style? What do you think the thing is about his style that really puts him there? Well, first of all, Jelly Roll was the first uh, composer, pianist, the first person to really define what jazz was and to, to put it down on paper, to arrange it, um, uh, and to, to make it sort of organized, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, and 
the way he played the piano was really the way you would hear his, uh, say, like his uh, uh, small ensemble, the Red Hot Peppers, uh, or sort of in any new New Orleans style small group, the way he played the piano was the way you heard the horns in a, in a, um, in a jazz band at that mm -hmm. time. You heard the clarinet in the top and then the trombone in the bottom and the band. And it, it, he really played in this very rich, thick polyphonic style. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very difficult. It's, it's, it's taken me years to, to really figure out, well, how does this all work together? Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a privilege to be here at the Library of Congress and to play in Coolidge Auditorium. As you know, uh, Jelly Roll uh, gave interviews to Alan Lomax in 1938 and um, on, on, on the stage at Coolidge. And uh, I remember when I was uh, in college, there was a box set, like a reissue box set. It looked like a piano mm -hmm. that came out. Um, of all these restored uh, Library of Congress tapes of, of Jelly Roll Morton. And I mean, just hours upon hours of, of, of interviews, of Jelly talking about New Orleans, and not just about his music, of course he talked about that, but sort of like these shady characters in New Orleans and, and some of these body um, parlor songs, um, uh, the murder ballad, Make Me a Pallet on the Floor, uh, The Dirty Dozen. Uh, and I, I could never figure out uh, when I first got the box set, it said explicit on it, like it had a D yeah. for explicit. <laughs> it's like, what, what could be so explicit in this? And then you hear it like, wow, that's, that, that rivals anything that you might hear today. Yeah. Um, but it's such a rich tradition, a, a rich oral count of a, of a bygone era. Mm -hmm. and, and I uh, definitely occasionally uh, reference uh, some of what what's on those recordings. Yeah, and you said you said during your concert that you uh, felt the ghost of Jelly Roll Martin while you were playing. Did that did that inform what you were doing on stage? I mean, it was a very um, it was a sort of a uh, surreal experience because I'm listening to the recordings for so many years and hearing the acoustics of the room. I I can understand why the recordings are so resonant. You can really hear the sound of the hall in those recordings. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you play on that stage, the, the, I mean, the acoustics, the quality of the sound is just amazing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely thought a lot about Jelly Roll Morton being up on that stage. And, at, you know, that was toward the end of his life when he, he made those recordings. And he was sort of considered to be, um, his style to be archaic. And, and I mean, he was basically bartending, managing this place, so, which is now Ben's Chili Bowl <laughs> on uh, U Street, uh, the Jungle Inn. And, you know, people, people weren't paying attention. He wasn't this sort of like uh, uh, figure, uh, iconic figure at that time. And, mm -hmm. and Alan was, uh, was, uh, was very uh, uh, smart, of course, to, to, to document him. And in fact, I read that he didn't even at first, he didn't really consider Jelly Roll to be a candidate for what he was trying to do, which was, it was, it was very much in the folklore yeah. category, and he thought jazz to be a bit more on the commercial side. And then once he started hearing Jelly Roll speak about uh, his history and about the history of, of New Orleans, he was like, oh, this, this guy is very much a, a part of uh, the American folklore tradition. Yeah, and yeah. a keeper of an oral tradition. Exactly, yeah. absolutely. So you've, you've uh, been able to spend a couple of days here at the library, yes? Yes. And uh, what have you seen that has made an impression on you so far? What haven't I seen? <laughs> I mean, really, um, I've been talking about when I go home in the, uh, in the evening, I, I, I call, I've called up a few friends uh, to talk to them about what kind of experience this is. And, and it's, it's really a hidden secret like, or, or, or an open, open secret. Uh, open you know, yeah, open, yeah, open secret, not hidden. Uh, it's a hidden treasure, that's what I meant. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, uh, I, I was taken around the Jefferson Building, well, that's where we're at right now, uh, saw the rare book collection, I held a book that was from 1600, a uh, book on Euclid. Um, I uh, saw Thomas Jefferson's uh, library, of course. Uh, I have to say, out of uh, everything, one of the highlights of this trip 
has been uh, handling a Beethoven score, his sonata, uh, piano sonata opus 109, mm -hmm. and an E uh, major, and I mean that that was pretty trippy, you know, just to see. And I, I had to ask Ray. I was like, like this is real, right? This yeah. is, this is <laughs> nobody faked this to make it look yeah. like a real copy. Right. It's a, yeah. And uh, he let me handle it and everything, and you know, he told me how to turn the pages and just that kind of connection to history. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very powerful, and I, I can't overemphasize the importance of, of being able to, to physically see something like that. You know, that's part of our cultural heritage, or see something by Jelly Roll Morton. I was here a couple years ago, in fact, it's not my first time to the library. I, I saw some of Jelly Roll's um, uh, submissions, including the, the original Jelly Roll Blues, 1915, which was the first jazz composition to be published, uh, Big Fat Ham, um, some of his other compositions, uh, some manuscripts, uh, sketches, and um, just to, to physically handle that and mm -hmm. to see uh, all the details. Uh, George Gershwin, uh, I saw uh, the manuscripts of the Rhapsody in Blue, the first manuscript submitted to Ferdy Grofay for the performance with Paul Whiteman mm -hmm. in 1924. Uh, uh, the Concerto in F. Um, what's also interesting is to see how composers write their handwriting and their legibility. For example, Gershwin was pristine. Like you can, I could literally have taken that score and read it, you know, or a conductor probably would have been able to, to read it and conduct an orchestra, no problem. You look at Beethoven, I, I don't know how anybody figured out how, how that went. Yeah. Because I mean, it's, I mean, you see his sketches and it's just like, well, what was this guy thinking? You know, was he, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, um, uh, then, then you actually see the manuscript, and it's a little better, but not much. But I mean, yeah. but, but you just see that he's still a genius. I mean, you see the, you kind of get a sense of their personality just by, you know, how they write, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and something about their thought process. And there's something yeah. about their process, something about their thought process, of course. So of course, yeah, the the, the manuscripts were, were amazing. Um, what else did we see? Uh, just. A few moments ago, I got I handled a, a Stradivarius viola, uh, and um, and there's a massive flute collection that I saw. Um, so th these, you know, these experiences I think are so important, uh, not only as a musician but just as someone who's interested in like our legacy, uh, our, our our heritage, you know, culturally. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really been a fantastic experience here. Yeah. So um, the, the way that you approach jazz has, to me at least, a, a, a learned or studied quality about it. Really? You deal, you deal, with, you deal with early jazz, you, you seem to be very influenced by John Lewis, by third stream music. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how classical music and jazz study, the study of those two things has, has come to play in your life, if it has at all. I mean, certainly they've come to play in, in the sense that I've had some sort of relationship to both. You know, I studied classical music from a young age and even through college I did some, some study uh, with a lady named Oksana Yablonskaya. And, um, and even now, you know, I, I, I do try to keep a certain uh, relationship to it, even though I'm not playing Beethoven or anything like that. But um, I, I feel with music, and you know, classical music is so um, uh, it's so deeply rooted in the the written tradition and and serving the intentions of the composer. You know, while also finding unique ways to express a uh, certain kind of affects or sentiment in the music. Um, but there's still, I believe, even with music that's 250 years old or more, there still has to be sort of an extemporaneous, spontaneous quality to it. And when you listen to uh, uh, 
Beethoven's first piano concerto or you listen to a Bach cantata, it feels like this was something that could have been written at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And in jazz music, um, which deals with a completely, in a completely different time period and era, uh, various cultural influences deeply rooted in the African American experience and the American experience, um, there's a lot of uh, oral history there, oral learning, uh, oral learning. I mean, with the, uh, you know, much of jazz, a lot of what we learn is through records and hearing records, although we can learn from transcriptions and, you know, if we're learning the American Songbook, we're going to look at sheet music, and, but we're still learning from, a, 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 in a tradition that's very much, we have recordings, which you can't listen to Mozart play one of his pieces, you know. Right. Uh, but we can listen to John Coltrane. So my point is that, you know, and w w one, of the, one of the qualities that, you know, is so valued in jazz is sort of the idea of improvisation. But even improvisation is organized and structured. You know, the greatest improvisers, um, listen to Louis Armstrong play that fanfare on West, West End Blues. It's like well, that in itself could be, somebody could have spent hours upon hours figuring out how to how to create that and and, and uh, Armstrong you know made it in you know one tape one, on a record so um, it's this balance between understanding structure uh, and and um, being uh, true to a language uh, but at the at the, or authentic to a language, but at the same time having the feeling of spontaneity, uh, feeling of, 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 of exploration and of adventure. Um, and it's a really kind of, for me, it's always like the balance between the two, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I've heard many jazz pianists, not many, I've heard some jazz musicians, not just pianists, you know, play, uh, say, the style of bebop or whatever and it's not very inspiring and everything is correct mm -hmm. you know all the notes are correct and the language is accurate but there's something that's some drive that's just not there and I've heard uh, a number of classical musicians on the other hand play a piece uh, that's hundreds of years old and it really feels like you know it's speaking to you in the moment mm -hmm. and I think that's just the mark of a great artist in any genre uh, they, they, they know how to communicate, those people know how to communicate something that, that transcends time yeah. and, and genre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, very much so. And one of the things that, uh, of course, I, before the concert on Saturday, I gave a little lecture about Gottschalk in here. Yeah, Louis yeah, Gottschalk. sure. And one of the things that really made an impression on me uh, was the way that you played the Danza by Gottschalk. Wow, okay. Because of exactly what you're talking about, that, that relationship between the spirit of the music and the notation of the music. Because so often when we hear people play that repertoire, it, they're coming from that classical tradition that ties them to the notes. And within that period, that 1850s period of music, even with, especially with Chopin, with with the influence of opera and so forth, you have a rhythmic freedom in that music that a lot of people don't take advantage of. And that's the thing that really struck me about your performance, was that you were playing the notes as they were written, but you had a rhythmic freedom within the music that really took it to a different oh, level. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about I that? I mean, I think about Alfred Cortot playing Chopin, or there's a, there's a video on YouTube, I think he's playing some Schumann, something from the Kindred scene, and, and listening to him play uh, this piece of music, he had like a certain kind of relationship that I don't, I don't know can be, I don't, I, I don't know if that's something that can be passed on, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, I mean, I'm not an expert on 19th century romanticism by any means, but, but I'd be curious like to go into a time machine and go back and, and, and meet with like Clara Schumann or Brahms or any of these people and, and just to hear how they play their own music. Mm -hmm. And I, I, 
I could bet money on it that it's a lot different than how people consider it today. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, notation is just an indication. Of course, I mean, there's only there's a limited amount that you can really notate. Um, I mean, there's a lot that you can, a lot of accuracy that you can get from notation, but still, the sound and the spirit of the music can only be heard. And um, and I, I have to be honest, like I play Gottschalk from my own, uh, you know, from from my own references. Uh, being someone like Jelly Roll Morton, who came much later. I mean, Gottschalk's middle 19th century. Jelly Roll's, uh, you know, born around 1885 or so. Um, but I, I think of, I think of uh, someone like Gottschalk or even Cervantes. I played once some of his Cuban dances. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think of them as as pieces for dance, pieces that have a certain kind of rhythmic drive, and that a lot of that comes from my experience with jazz. I mean, it, it's it's it has to feel a certain way, and has to have a certain kind of momentum and rhythmic propulsion to it. And, and certainly playing the, the danza, you know, it, it has a Spanish tinge, evidently, mm -hmm. the, or the Haban era. And, and I really want to exploit that and bring that out in the music. Um, um, but I, I'm not sure how Gottschalk would have really played that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you think, know? I think what you, what you got at was, was very good. Oh, thank I mean, you. That, that kind of, that kind of rubato, that rhythmic freedom, I thought was wonderful. Oh, thank you. And you know the way that he sort of writes out ornamentation. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice Thanks. Um, so also on stage on Saturday, um, you talked a little bit about uh, Billy Taylor. Yeah. And we have Billy Taylor's manuscripts here. Um, I heard. A, there's a, a connection with the library. What What was your uh, experience with, with uh, Dr. Taylor? I didn't know him very well. Um, we've we met a handful of times, and um, here at the Kennedy Center, he came. I think at about 2008, I did something at the Kennedy Center around Jelly Roll Morton. I believe he came to the concert. Um, he uh, was invo involved with the Jazz Museum in Harlem, if I un if I remember correctly, um, and uh, I went to a few things that he he did there. I was living in Harlem uh, at the time. Um, he told me a story once, and I, and, I, and I told the story on stage the other night about him going to hear Jelly Roll Morton, and basically, uh, you know, he, he and his friends at the, at the Jungle Inn were sort of making fun of Jelly Roll's style, you know, mm -hmm. saying that it was uh, old and kind of mocking him. And he, he was playing the piano, and he turned around and he said, you punks can't play this. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Taylor admitted, he says, yeah, he was right, we couldn't play it. Um, and, and what a, a, a man, and his contribution, talking about Dr. Taylor, his, his contribution to really um, uh, the, the, the education in, of jazz and, mm -hmm. to, and, and exposing people through television. Of course, he, he was an ambassador at CBS Sunday Morning. And I mean, he was one of the, the first people uh, I remember seeing on television talking about jazz, maybe besides someone like Mort Marsalis. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and there's some qu quite a few programs that I like to watch occasionally on YouTube. Uh, his like duo piano series. That did you ever, have you ever seen those? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's really cool. yeah. so yeah. Um, I'm 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 sorry I didn't get a chance to know him a little better, but I I, I knew him. I mean I met him a handful of times. Yeah, and it, along that vein of <clears throat> of the question of jazz education, that's something that's that's changed a lot over the past even 20 years or so, even sooner than that. I, I went to graduate school at the University of North Texas, and there's a yeah, very yeah, structured jazz program there. It's very, uh, the curriculum is very set. It's the, Everybody has an idea of what they're doing. Um, but there are two sides to that coin. And um, I'm just wondering what your impression is of jazz education as it exists today when it's becoming more conservatory based. Because what you've been talking about is much more of an oral tradition, of a learned tradition in a different way. I, I went to Juilliard. I was in the, th the second year, the third year of the jazz program, the existence of the jazz program there. And I, I had a lot of great experiences at Juilliard, a lot of resources available at my disposal. I was able to, to um, uh, forge relationships with my peers, with whom I still perform today. Um, 
uh, I mean, there, there, I mean, I can go on and on about the list of um, assets that uh, Juilliard afforded me. But at the same time, this, I mean, I don't think it's just with jazz, even classical music, it is a life, it's a life experience, and mm -hmm. you have to really live it. It can't just be something that you go to school and you learn about, but you have to go out, and you have to play, you have to be around people who want to listen, maybe some people who don't want to listen. You have to try to convert them, I don't know. I mean, being in New York and living in New York certainly afforded me a certain kind of opportunity um, to be uh, around people who, a pretty robust and rich jazz community. I mean, it's still basically the jazz capital of the world. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not going to say that uh, uni conservatories and universities with jazz programs aren't valuable because, but because they are. But it's only supplementary, mm -hmm. okay, to the complete picture. Right. Um, and. Uh, it's, it's great to have your, you know, fundamentals in a classroom about the history of jazz or theory or you know, just sort of practical application, but you really don't get the experience until you play on the bandstands, until you're, you're actually around the culture of the music. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, you, you, you really have to have the whole, the whole package. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you play solo, you play in combos, you do a lot of different um, configurations on stage. And I'm wondering how you approach the piano mm -hmm. and how you pr pr approach improvisation uh, differently depending on A, what kind of configuration you're in on stage, and B, if you're playing music that you wrote versus music that someone else wrote. Wow, it's, um, th those are good questions, and I, I sort of have to think about them because, um, I mean, certainly when I'm playing by myself, there's a, a certain amount of freedom that I have because I don't have to interact with anybody. Right. Uh, but that, with that comes a lot of responsibility because you have to be uh, balanced with how you present a performance, and it just can't go off into a tangent, you know. Um, I find playing solo piano to be very difficult. I mean, difficult in that the responsibility is sol solely on me to communicate and engage with um, the listener. And even playing a Coolidge the other night, and I had played most of those pieces a number of times, it's, you know, because the, the pieces are, can be so different. Some of them are similar, but some of them are going from like the Cervantes to going to something like the Aaron Copeland, you know, it's like very, very different. Yeah. Um, and I have to, I have to pace myself, and I have to really be focused and in a frame of mind where, I, where I'm, you know, I'm not just wandering. My mind's not just wandering, and it's just kind of like, okay, I'm playing. It's just none of that. Now, when um, I'm playing with other people, it's easier for me, I'd say, to draw from inspiration. I mean, uh, it can go both ways. I mean, it could be I'm playing. It could just be an off night playing with my normal band. And maybe somebody isn't uh, feeling as strong or presenting strong ideas, or I'm not presenting strong ideas, so it can be kind of hard to really draw inspiration. But but when uh, when it's on a, a really good night and everyone's super focused and um, you know very passionate. Uh, I find it, it, it just being so easy. Just uh, you hear an idea, you hear a motif, and you can you go with that, and and uh, this sort of uh, reciprocity happen, happening. Uh, I feel like that's uh, it's a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, it's not always your turn. Yeah. It's the, yeah. Exactly. It's not always your turn. Yeah. You can be supportive. Um, uh, playing with orchestra, for example, I've been playing some of Gershwin's piano. Mm -hmm. with the orchestra and that's something I haven't been doing as long you know uh, really so I'm still now getting comfortable with that to a certain degree but on one end you have orchestra musicians you have 80 musicians who are essentially playing what's in front of them on the other hand you got let's say 2,000 people watching you and it's you playing the piano and I, I tell you that there isn't a more nerve-wracking feeling than that I mean and then also wanting to feel free and spontaneous and 
You know, it's, it's very hard. Like I played in Des Moines, Iowa, not too long ago, but last weekend it was a cancellation for Concerto Neff. So I got called, somebody called me to do it. And uh, the first night, and I hadn't played it in maybe, maybe almost a year or so. And uh, first night, I was like, I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna not, not worry, you know, maybe I'm not super, super comfortable because I only had two days to really get it back together. But I'm just gonna just let it all go and, and see where, where, what happens. And I had some missed notes and you know things. I mean, I, I guess it's not that big of a deal, but it wasn't as pristine as I would have liked it. So the next night, <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna just play more accurately and focus on making sure everything is right and maybe the tempos would be slower because I, I was really pushing the tempo the first night. You know, and I think the orchestra was kind of trying to catch up with me. So <laughs> I play things with uh, maybe a few clicks slower and just being more, just breathing more in the phrases. And then when I listened back to the recordings later, I was like, I like the first night better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just because something is, is, is correct mm -hmm. doesn't always mean it's, it's, it's good. Yeah. You know, having Maybe that, not. yeah. So having having that fire, you know, is 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 important. But it's hard when you know you have that pressure, and all these people just zeroing on you, and it's just like, yeah. yeah it's, did you feel like you were? Did you feel like you were taking the other musicians on stage along on a ride with you when you were doing that? Uh, did you I try that to. I try to. But you know, it's it, it can be hard in those settings. Because they, they're already playing a bunch of music. This is one out of maybe five pieces on the program. And, you know, it, it might not be something that they all really are that excited about playing, you know. I mean, it just depends. Um, it depends on the orchestra. I mean, Des Moines played very, very well, and I enjoyed playing with them. Um, it, it, it just depends. I know one thing I get, um, feedback I get from orchestra musicians, because it's just not really common in that world, is when I do improvise on condensas, they're mm -hmm. like, I mean, and usually, I mean, it's different every night, and it might not even be that good, but, <laughs> but the fact that I'm improvising, you know, they're like, wow, and I, I just feel like that's, that's a tradition that um, I would love to see more in, in classical music, people who are playing Beethoven, or I know Robert Levin, who's a great pianist, oh, I don't yeah. know if he's been, he's, he's really in, in, mm -hmm. in that stuff. And uh, I mean, it's that, that music is just as much uh, modern and living and breathing as you know music by you know someone who's writing today. I, I don't really believe I, I didn't come up. Let's say I it wasn't brought up in thinking like Bach is old and you know whatever's the hottest today is that's you know current yeah i never saw music i always saw music <laughs> as being really great or you know okay or really bad <laughs> you know, it's you know i never saw music or 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 made um uh, uh opinions about judgment about music based on their the air they were in yeah I just isn't uh, it duke ellington who said there's two kinds of music good music and bad yeah music. yeah yeah it's exactly exactly that i just you know i never came up thinking like that yeah um, so did you see the Rhapsody in Blue manuscript? I did, yeah. When you were here? yeah. And you saw that Gershwin didn't write out the cadence. Yeah, he. Did. You know what? He wrote out more than I thought he did. Mm -hmm. uh, when he the one that he su submitted to Grofay, I, I was like, oh, okay, he really did. He he did uh, he did write out more than I thought. But there was one cadenza where he was just like, watch me for the cue. Yeah. You know? And. Um, you know, or Gershwin was an improviser, so I mean, he, you know, I, I'm sure he, he had performances where he didn't he didn't play exactly was what was written. That's been a actually a, um, I think for some some music critics they 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 aren't sure what to do with it when I improvise on the look at because yeah. it's like sacrilege, <laughs> like that's not what he wrote or whatever. Which yeah. you know, I can understand that line of thinking, and. Uh, it could also be just that the, the improvisations were that good, but that's okay too. It's just like that's the beauty of the. I mean, there's some nights it's going to be good, and sometimes nights it's not going to be. I think in classical music, there's this pressure to always it has to be mm -hmm. this, yeah. you know, 
and that's not part of the journey of a, a performer, you know, you're, you're a human being. So, um, but yeah, I mean, Gershwin, uh, he was he was a great improviser, and he knew a lot of the uh, the great Harlem Stride pianists. He knew uh, he knew Fats Waller. He and Fats were friends. Um, I think he knew Tatum. Um, uh, he I, I remember reading somewhere he commented on Earl Hines' uh, Gershwin album that he did, mm -hmm. and how he how much he liked that. Uh, so he, he he really loved jazz music, and he he had a lot of respect for jazz musicians. And you know, some people feel like maybe that. Uh, George Gershwin had sort of swiped uh, their ideas from him, and and um, you know, and I'm not going to really get into that debate, but but um, you know, certainly you can hear the influence and the homage to to a lot of these these um, uh, American African American musical giants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the things that we deal with a lot here, obviously, is is notated music in the in the music division, right? Really? And we've talked a little bit about uh, <laughs> we've talked a little bit about how that notation is a framework for for jazz, right? We have a lot of jazz here, and a lot of scholars tend to come in and look at the early printed music, mm -hmm. you know, the the Scott Joplin, um, the early rag and the early blues and the early jazz up to Jelly Roll Martin, hmm. and there seems to be a lot of uh, a lot of ambiguity in those terms. Like early jazz versus ragtime? Or? Rag versus blues. Rag versus blues. Versus jazz. So you have people like Jelly Roll Morton calling things blues that are really, uh, that are really jazz. You have people playing ragtime and saying it's also known as the blues. So what, as a pianist, and I'm not looking for a you know, history necessarily, but as a pianist playing this repertoire, what do you see as the distinction between specifically ragtime and blues as it existed in at the turn of the century, 1910s, 1950s now? Hmm. Either in the way that you approach well, let, it or well, the let, let's let's talk about. I mean, the blues. I I, I went back to read uh, and I, I wrote a composition that I played at, at um, Coolidge the other night called mm -hmm. "Blues People," which right. was uh, uh, the the title of a book by Leroy Jones uh, or a Mary Baraka, as he was known later. Um, and it's really interesting his his sort of definition uh, of you know blues and how blues came to be, it's not so clear cut as we all would like to make it to be. Right. Um, I mean, certainly blues, I mean, think about the instrument that I play, I play piano. Ragtime uh, uh, was a, the piano was the primary instrument for ragtime. You know, at the, the end of the 19th century, to, I mean, the Make Believe Rag was what 1896. I mean, it was written for the piano. Now, you had various uh, uh, arrangements for uh, larger ensembles and and uh, you know brass band or whatever people would play the tune, but it was written for piano. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this was the common instrument in a home. You know, at, at the at the end of the 19th century. Blues, and you know, I see as much more itinerant type of music, mm -hmm. and the piano isn't a mobile, really a mobile instrument. Right. And the piano is, um, you know, very stationary. So, uh, and I see something like the guitar, or um, the harmonica, or uh, um, certainly the human voice. You know these being primary instruments of the blues and the and the and the blues culture, and so as such, you're going to hear more repertoire uh, in the blues tradition, and you know, in, in that framework. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, the blues can be transmitted to the piano, but even when I played a piece by Robert Johnson, uh, "Come On in My Kitchen," uh, it was basically uh, it wasn't a really a transcription, but it was you know, in essence, m my uh, interpretations based on hearing Robert Johnson and transmitting that to the piano. Mm 
-hmm. But I, I still think even the piano can't get that kind of quality that the guitar and certainly the human voice can get when singing blues. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I think a lot of the distinctions, I mean, it's asking me as a pianist, you know, it, it has a lot to do with the instrument. Yeah. And, uh, um, uh, and Jelly Roll even, you know, uh, I mean, his pieces, all, he, had, he had his Red Hot Peppers in the 20s. Um, and his pieces, though, were definitely he had the the idea of the, the the New Orleans band in mind, but you know he basically transmitted that sound to the instrument of the piano. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so. Um, so does it have a lot to do with the bending of uh, notes and finding that space in between, or is it something else? I don't know. I mean, I really don't know how to define it. Uh, it's like going back to Robert Johnson. I remember in the jazz history class in Ju Ju Juilliard, my first year with Lauren Schoenberg he had us try to transcribe a Robert Johnson blues, and it was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Because there was no, I mean, we think of the blues as being this 12-bar form and you know, this very clear-cut structure. And, I mean, Johnson would switch chords in the middle of measures. Uh, there were the, no chorus would be a precise 12 bars. You know, uh, I mean, it would just be all over the place. Mm -hmm. If you really sit down and you try to analyze, I mean, it took us maybe an hour to kind of figure out what he was doing. Yeah. Um, so, it, there's only so much precision you're going to get out of that, yeah. really. Yeah, I heard, I heard an interview with Keith Richards once that said when they were listening, as young kids, when they were listening to Robert Johnson, they thought that there were two guitarists. Playing. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, was yeah. There so much happening. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really a lot to process, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I wanted to... Um, show you a couple things from the collection, just to kind of get your impression of, of different sure. things that we have, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about ragtime, a little bit about blues, like we've been, like we've been saying. This um, Maple Leaf Rag, obviously, as you said earlier, everybody knows what Maple Leaf Rag sounds like, right? Sure. And this is the first edition of, uh, of Maple Leaf Rag. Wow. And this was actually published in 1899 for the first time. It says Tempo di Marcia, right? Yes. And one of the things that Scott Joplin says about ragtime in his School of Ragtime uh, sort of tutorial that he, that he wrote is to never play ragtime too fast, yep. right? Yep. And this march tempo that he has here sort of speaks to that as well. So when you're approaching ragtime, how do you approach tempo? I mean, is it that simple? Not, don't play too fast? I mean, do you, you know, play it too I'll fast? be honest, I'm not really a ragtime expert. Yeah. Um, you know, I play some ragtime, but I had mentioned earlier off camera a guy named Terry Waldo, who mm -hmm. is from Columbus, Ohio, my hometown. And yeah. uh, going back to my, my experience as a, as a teenager, uh, when I went to New York, uh, made a visit to New York, I might have been auditioning or something. Uh, I went to Terry's house and uh, on the Upper West Side, and he spent a good two hours with me talking about ragtime and uh, uh, how to play it. And uh, he has a really great book called This Is Ragtime. And he studied with UB Blake. Mm -hmm. And it's so different from anything uh, in terms of, I mean, its, it's relationship to jazz, the, the, the rhythmic feel, it's, it's, it's not, um, how do I say, it's not, there's a, it's not as strict as some people probably think, ragtime, but it also has a certain amount of, of rigidity in the, in the sense of it's, like you say, it should be played a certain way. Um, I, I try to be as, as true to the genre as I can, can be at this point. But uh, one thing I've learned is not to play it too fast. Yeah. Um, but people can play it too slow, too. Mm -hmm. um, it can be choppy, you know. Um, and that's something I always had to work on, is not to make it too, like, sounding like too metronomic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it has to breathe in a certain way. Um, yeah, it's it's um, 
it's it's actually I think one of those genres, ragtime specifically, that very few people get right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Dick Hyman is w- one who really I mean he knows all kinds of piano styles and he's right, but um, and of course Terry, but. Um, you know, maybe I have to look into doing a, like a serious Joplin <laughs> thing in the future to really to delve into it. Yeah, but it's jo- really a study. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, yeah. Right? But you know, the thing about something like the Maple Leaf that was adapted in so many different settings in jazz. You know, jazz takes from all kinds of genres and, and styles, and and uh, there's like the Sidney Bechet version. You know, that mm-hmm. there's a the version of. Uh, uh, there's a Jelly Roll. Ver- oh, actually, he plays it on the Library of Congress recordings. Yeah. He plays he 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 plays it really fast. If I remember this correctly, he plays it really fast. And and one example, uh, sort of like as a um, an example of of, of correct ragtime. And then another example, he he puts his stamp on her Jelly Roll, and it yeah. and it is incredibly groovy. I mean, I remember listening to that over and over again. Like, how do you get that right kind of balance of syncopation? So, but to, 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 to play, I mean, also ragtime, just one last thought. I think about um, Willie the Lion Smith and the m- memoirs of Willie the Lion Smith. He talks about how he was sort of mocking ragtime pianists as, you know, pianists who really don't have, they don't have a good left hand. And, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, there's always these kinds of one-upmanship that some of these pianists like to say, oh, you know, he, he didn't play as, this style wasn't as good as my style, right. and you know, that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. but um, anyhow. Yeah, so an- another thing that is in this folder is actually a copy of the uh, publishing agreement that Scott Joplin had with John Stark and Sons in St. Louis. Hmm. And it talks about what kind his, of What kind of fine print is in yeah. here? <laughs> well, this is, this is the thing, is that it's really a, a known as a pretty fair agreement that Stark's, Stark's selling this music and Joplin gets one cent from every piece of sheet music that Stark sells, and then Stark will sell him pieces of the music to sell for five cents, and he can't sell it for more than 25 cents. Okay, right. so how much was a which how much was a piece of uh, music? So the sheet music was about was twenty five cents. One twenty five cents. Okay. Yeah. So he got his own copies to sell for five cents, and he had the whole profit. Okay, and then any and then any anything that Stark starts, sold, he got a penny. For was it. there an inventory of of how how many <laughs> <laughs> how many, how many sheets of music Stark sold? Like he could have said, "Well, I sold I sold two hundred copies," but then he really sold five hundred. It's possible. Oh yeah, it's yeah, possible. Just, <laughs> I, I was thinking about this because also the Mel- Melrose brothers really screwed over Jelly Roll more in like mm-hmm. big time, and also ASCAP, which yeah. like uh, he got he got ripped off big time, and and, and one of the reasons why he was, um, I think, so bitter at the end of his life because he, I mean, yeah, intending both. Yeah, 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 exactly. So anyhow, yeah, but I thought this was interesting just to uh, talk a little bit about the business of music and kind of how that how that affects. The way that you approach being a jazz musician, because there is this long history. Um, this was comparatively fair, I think, mm-hmm. but there's a long history of the business side of jazz really getting in the way of people reaching their potential. And I, I just wonder what it's like today and, and how that history I mean, uh, speaks know, to you as a musician. I was just talking to another musician about this last night. You know, so many musicians, I feel like, are um, the business of music is important, and you have to know uh, what is fair, what's within your rights. You know how to to get the the maximum potential out of your creativity. You know mm-hmm. it's already difficult as it is. I I do think though that we're in a position now where it's harder to really focus on our craft without becoming too consumed with the business aspect of it. Uh, the, uh, and, and, be, and that partly could be because the music is uh, more entrepreneurial now than certainly, you know, mm-hmm. somebody like Scott Joplin would have, you know, he, it was much more hierarchical at that, at that time. Uh, and maybe there are a few exceptions, you know. But certainly, as a as a black musician in America, I mean, you know, you were, 
you know, you were lucky to have someone like Stark, you know, on your side selling your music, um, uh, because uh, uh, it was it was a difficult uh, playing field. Uh, but even now, um, I think I think what's essential is to to provide good content and and really letting the content. Um, speak for itself and doing what you can to, to, to sell and promote it instead of the other way around where a lot of people are finding you know very uh, catchy ways to and, and, and attractive ways to sell content that might not be that great <laughs> mm -hmm. you know they put a nice bow yeah on they it. put a nice bow on it yeah. and um, yeah, and so many musicians I run across, you know, they, they, they talk more about the music business than they talk about music. Mm. That really bothers me. Yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I want to talk about this. Yeah. You know, of course you have to, but there's a time to talk about business. But I love, like, I was in, like, I was a kid in a candy store going in that archive today, you know, uh, and yesterday. Uh, looking at all those manuscripts and it's like, wow, all of this stuff is available for free? Yeah. <laughs> like, really? Um, and, but a, a lot of the conversations that, you know, uh, I can have sometimes is more focused on, you know, other elements that it doesn't have to do with the content. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at a couple of more pieces. Um, one of the composers I know that you've you've played a little bit as Lucky Roberts. Oh, yeah, this yeah. This is actually I'm... a manuscript of his Navy Blues. Okay. So can you tell me a little bit about your experience playing Lucky Roberts and where you came uh, across that name? Well, actually through Terry w Waldo. Yeah? Uh, he I had this uh, NPR or, or yeah PBS or something uh, like a radio broadcast back maybe like 15, 20 years ago called This Is Ragtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard this this piece that I really liked. Um, Glenn Miller actually uh, made, I think he, he, he made, I don't know if he made it famous, but he, he did play it. Um, I'm just, it's blanking. It's like, it's like Moonlight Serenade. Or, no, no, not, not that one. Uh, I think it's called Pork and Beans. Oh. You know, you know, pork and beans, and and then there's another name for it, and it's it's escaping my memory now. But anyhow, uh, I did record pork and beans, or I can't remember the other name. I recorded that on a live album, the Caramore, and which was interesting about him is he was apparently he was a really successful business, uh, a real estate guy. He made some mm -hmm. money in real estate, and I don't know. He's, it seemed like. Um, sort of obscure figure that I never heard about that yeah. I wanted to, to sort of <laughs> to, to explore a little bit more. Yes, uh, Luckieth Roberts, um, Navy Blues. I never heard this one, to be honest. Yeah, it's a, it's a song uh, about, it was published in World War I, and it's, you know, about the military and so forth. Again, I love to see people's handwriting. Mm hmm Huh. <laughs> It's great. You know what would be really cool is, I know there are probably like a lot of uh, liabilities with it, but like at Coolidge to have people do concerts with the, like the original music. Yeah. You know, like that, like actually use, I think that would be so use, cool. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> you have to have like a. a that would be something. Yeah, probably have to have someone standing, yeah. <laughs> making sure you don't tear the page. <laughs> so speaking of, Oh yeah. Handwriting. So this is the manuscript of Keeping Out of Mischief now, and then this uh, is the first published edition. Okay. You see in the in the published edition he's added some dotted some dotted rhythms and some different things, but you got the basic melody here. Right. I mean and also you have to understand uh, I mean, this, all of this had to be transferred for the, to the sheet music for like home use. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of, uh, I get asked even by students, like, why are the piano parts so simplistic? And, and sometimes they're not that interesting in terms of the, you know, the accompaniment. Um, 
and it was basically just written for amateurs, you know, to mm-hmm. use at home. At home, so it's interesting to see how. Like, like I wonder. Sometimes I wonder how much, and it depends on the composer. How much of the harmony? Like this is just a uh, a lychee with the melody. There are no chords or anything. Mm-hmm. And if you had like uh, someone in the publishing house actually uh, realizing the harmony. Or if the composer helped do that, or you know how that worked, or you know if, if this was in fact what Fats Waller submitted mm-hmm. uh, to um, whoever the, the publisher is, right. then then you know how much information was at their disposal. Is this my sa- the same question I have about like Beethoven and his manuscript? If you if you see the sonata, you're just like, how could anybody know what that is? Yeah. So how was that? How did when the publisher saw that? How did <laughs> how did he realize? How did he go from what's on the manuscript to essentially what we now know and see today? Yeah. You know. And you have a number of fair copies and first editions yeah. and things that are always being corrected. Exactly. Because like there is that ambiguity. Right. And what struck me were these were these dotted figures that I thought maybe were written for somebody who didn't know how to swim. Well, that's yeah. They, that's that's uh, that's an interesting uh, observation because um, a lot of times these. Um, the sheet music doesn't have any any real sense of syncopation in it at all. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much as straightforward as you can get. But the, the the great thing about that as a jazz musician is that, I mean, this should be. And Bill Charlap, the great pianist, told me that this should be our first reference when we're learning a piece of song from the American Songbook. You know, don't go to any of the recordings. Mm-hmm. Um, but go to the sheet music because then you can see the actual melody. Now maybe the rhythm isn't that hip, and that we're not looking for you know rhythmic uh, sophistication. We're looking for you know what what's what's the original melody? What are the intervals that are used? You know, right. what what are the lyrics? Is there a verse? You know, is the verse good? Can we use the verse? You know, sometimes those verses weren't as great as others. <laughs> so. Um, you know what are some of the original harmonies to the tune? I mean, and sometimes we can get so we try to get so fancy uh, and sophisticated with the way we harmonize things that that it's maybe too rich for its own good. Mm-hmm. You know, and when we go and see the original sheet music, something that's so simple can really be even more effective than trying to put you know too much sugar, yeah. you know, in your oatmeal. Right. So. Yeah. So I just wanted to show you that and sort of get your impressions. And I think we're getting close to uh, time, so we don't have time to go through all of this. But there's one thing uh, in particular that I wanted you to see, which is. Oh, wow, it's Ellington. Blind Man's Bluff, which from 1923. And this is the first pop song, the first copyright deposit of anything. Oh, really? That Duke Ellington wrote, that he submitted. And it was a pop song that he wrote with J.H. Uh, Trent, and there were a number of songs that, that came out, but this is, this is the first one. So can you talk a little bit about um, Duke Ellington and sort of your impressions of seeing this? I mean, um... Again, it's just like so little information on <laughs> on this. I mean, what I what I like, what's interesting to me about these submissions, because I saw this somewhere else in the archive, not from Duke Ellington, where they they submitted the melody, and on a separate sheet they submitted the lyrics. Like, why wouldn't they put it all on one page? You know, I'm just curious, like if yeah. there's like some sort of protocol format that they had to follow, because it would make sense to me. Like, okay, I mean, it's kind of analyzing. And I wish there was like a camera above so people could see. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to see. But yeah. you know, where does the verse start? The verse starts right here, and it goes all the way to this double bar line, presumably, mm-hmm. and then the chorus starts right here. So. You look at the verse, that's right here. You can you know, sort of put the verse on there. 
And then there are two choruses, but it even says chorus, and then it says third chorus. So uh, do, you, do you sing this twice, and then the third time you sing that? I don't know, it's just interesting, like just format-wise, mm -hmm. how they submitted, uh, people would submit the lyrics separately from the actual music. Yeah, and sort of the whole issue of text underlay and all that sort of thing, I guess maybe. Maybe. Wasn't that important? to them, or, or I've also considered the fact that maybe because this is the work of J.H. Trent and this is the work of Duke Ellington. That is a good, that is a good point. That definitely could be, I mean, this is Duke's, is this proven to be Duke's manuscript? I've seen Duke's manuscript it's before. Not, it's not, that's, it's not, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, I was, I was like, this doesn't look like Duke's no. handwriting. Um, yeah. So if you were gonna play this piece, and that's what you had. I mean, would you do it? Or do you have an approach? I mean, there are some tricks that you can use as a musician to, to realize the harmony based on a melody. I mean, if you can, you, you can, you can see the, um, where the melody, the direction the melody is going, it starts on a one chord maybe. It's like it's in, uh, uh, it looks like it's in C. E, it looks like it's E flat major or C minor. Well, it looks like it, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a, I'm guessing like a blues maybe. Mm -hmm. So uh, even the chorus, the chorus could be more difficult, but I could say, I could with relative confidence say that this is a, a one chord, a tonic chord or E flat major chord right here. Uh, and then because this is an F sharp, and the augmented uh, five was used uh, quite frequently. That might be a B flat augmented chord. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are ways that you can kind of yeah. guess. But would I perform it? Um, maybe, but I, I, I'm going to actually listen to a recording of this later on today and to see yeah. how it goes. You know, um, but yeah, there's so little information there. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, can't really say with a hundred percent certainty that. This is this would be correct if I were right. to play it. And so you need to have that recording. One needs to have that recording. Yeah, and that's the and that's and that's and that's, and that's also yeah. the, the the privilege that we have today. That mm -hmm. you know, if you were looking at a piece of uh, Chopin's, <laughs> you know, you're kind of out of luck yeah. to really know what it was what was supposed how it's supposed to go. Yeah, and we um, we were talking about blues, and this is Pine Top Smith. Mm. Nobody knows you when you're down and out. Okay, see, well, this is this has the lyrics. Yeah, it has uh, the lyrics on it. Uh, you see how the melody works and, and all that. Is this a song that you know? No, I don't. Oh. I don't. Okay. This is, um, I do not know it. Nobody knows when you're down and out. Yeah, this is, it's a, it's a really great uh, blues about living live the high life and having all these friends. Yeah, then, I have to look yeah. it up. Yeah, it's been Pine Top, okay. Yeah. 1929, mm -hmm. okay. And Lots of blues. And one thing here is James Reese Europe. Yeah, sure. And this is the yes. Castle House rag. Okay. That he wrote, obviously, for Mr. and Mrs. Vernon Castle. Yes, the yes, dance the dance team, duo, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you could just say a little bit about James Reese Europe and your impressions of him as you've been sort of studying jazz and, and getting to know this music, do you have a sense of who he was and why he was uh, such a major figure at this time? That's a question for Dayton, Jason Moran. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> He's been studying it. I have, I have actually not, uh, I've not studied as much James Reese Europe, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, um, um, he was certainly a figure that to, uh, to, to, to be, he was, he was an ambassador for you know, early American music, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and was one of the first to really unionize jazz musicians in New York. Exactly. With the club, club and all that. But yeah, I've never seen. A, I've never. I've seen. I've seen copies. Obviously, this is the first mm -hmm. edition. Yeah. Oh wow. 
and you have the trio section like you suspect. And it really speaks, I think, to the idea of the importance of dance as a I mean, as a part of jazz. That's right? that's that's. Um, I mean, the music pre nineteen forty five really it was it was rooted in dance. It was functional music, mm -hmm. um, and even though we're not dancing to jazz much anymore. I feel like that's an essential for me personally. This is my own personal like aesthetic uh, choice, but I feel like in some ways the music always has to have that quality of dance to mm -hmm. it, the, the rhythm, the groove. Yeah. You know, even if it's um, it's not as demonstrative, you know, um, and it's a little bit more. Um, could be subdued, you know, but it's still always present. It's a maybe a bit subliminal, but it's always present yeah. in the music, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, there are some people who believe that we should bring, you know, dance back into the forefront with jazz, which I think is, I think in a way, like with um, with hip hop, you know, you think about somebody like Robert Glasper, yeah. uh, which I know is a bit of a different tradition, but uh, you know, people are dancing, to, you know, to sort of this jazz hip hop fusion, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and do you think that's really taking jazz back to its roots in a certain way, even though it's going in a different direction? I, I think, um, I think in terms of the functionality it is, I mean, as far as the, the, the content of the music itself, there are certain threads and elements that are, that are, uh, that are rooted in jazz, but you know, jazz uses the triplet mm -hmm. beat, the triplet figure. I mean, hip hop is very much, although there are elements of the triplet figure, it's also very duple based. So you're 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 also dealing with like two different uh, sort of rhythmic uh, uh, subdivisions, right. you know. Um, and a lot of people just just cannot. I mean, because it's not prevalent in, in our society, you know, not on the radio, not necessarily on TV. It's hard for people to, to feel that, that swing beat. You know, mm -hmm. if they, they hear a piece of, you know, a really somebody like Elvin Jones, it's not going to hit them as hard as, as um, you know, someone else who's, you know, um, closer to, you know, the things that they grew up with. Right, sure. Know. Yeah, and it, I mean, music's all about your personal experience. Uh, absolutely, music. absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate you coming James. and talking to me. It's a really interesting conversation. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. My yeah. pleasure. And it was great having you at the library. Oh, my pleasure.